impact of decision making process that leads to maybe impairment of uh, psychiatric or neurological disease or the other way around, whether disease uh, it, uh, would affect the uh, decision making. So I think uh, we have lots to talk about. Uh, so let's begin with Kathy. Well, I, I want to thank you uh, for the invitation to be here today and to be a part of um, truly a remarkable group of scientists here. I'm very flattered that I'm here as a clinician to give comment. Um, so I work on the neurological end of the spectrum. I work with Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, primarily, I see patients with three different kinds of neurodegenerative disorders, which I think have implications for um, decision making um, and for the topic here today. So the, the main population I see are patients with neurodegenerative diseases due to Alzheimer's disease dementia. The second would be I see um, less frequently frontotemporal dementias, which are a disorder affecting the um, prefrontal cortex. And then I also see a large group of patients with Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementias. In addition to those three neurodegenerative kinds of dementias that we will see in our clinic, um, I will also see um, disorders that are due to small vessel disease in the brain or to completed strokes within the brain. And those can occur in isolation or can occur in the context of each of those three degenerative conditions that I just described. In each of those three degenerative conditions, problems with decision making can occur. And so what I find really um, exciting about what I've heard here today is that I think that what we're learning in the neuroscience of decision making has tremendous implications for clinical practice down the road. It can help us to much better understand our patients and to begin to think about ways that we might be able to actually design tools to identify people who are vulnerable to uh, problems with decision making and maybe even come up with some strategies for intervening. So in Alzheimer's disease, all three conditions that I've just described um, involve different brain systems and I think they provide a very complementary approach to what we heard today about animal models and computational models. We have natural experiments that are occurring within people who unfortunately have diseases within particular neural circuits. The decision problems that you see in Alzheimer's disease certainly occur very late in the illness, but even very early at the MCI stage, we see problems with making decisions. We have paradigms where we ask people to make decisions about medical care, and we can look at how they weigh those decisions and come to uh, form an opinion. And that can be um, impaired in these patients and on functional imaging studies as well as in MRS studies about spectroscopy, we can actually see changes within very discrete areas of the frontal lobe. When we go to the frontal temporal dementias, we can see problems in the prefrontal cortex, and that has tremendous implications for the behaviors that they express. And then finally, with Parkinson's disease, you know better than I that that's been a tremendously powerful model for looking at the different areas of the basal ganglia and how that's involved in decision making. So three different degenerative diseases, three different neural systems involved can give us tremendous insights into what's going on in the brain in a disordered um, medical decision, uh, disordered decision making, different systems where they're involved, and I think that can inform what you're doing with the, um, the models that are being developed, and in addition, what we learn from, um, thank you, from neurosciences can actually help inform um, how we approach our patients and, and how we deliver care. So I, I found it very exciting, and I hope we can dialogue about how what we're learning at the neuroscience and may actually help us in clinical practice. Yeah, and I'd like to echo um, everything that Kathy said in terms of just uh, my I enthusiasm being here, and I've, I've learned a tremendous amount, and it's really, um, it's a privilege as a clinician to sit here, even if it's a little bit... Uh, mentally challenging for me to is you sort of go beyond my comfort level and area of expertise to incorporate and integrate all the cool stuff that, that I've, I've listened to today. So I, I work uh, clinically and, and with my research with two basic populations um, that are um, probably a little bit different from what Kathy described. These are not, neuro, well, not uh, at least traditionally thought as neurodegenerative uh, problems. Um, and the phenotypes are a bit softer. So I work um, primarily 
I run a, a clinic focused on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, which is a problem that typically emerges uh, early in life, um, has very strong evidence of, of heritability um, and a genetic component. We're learning more and more about the neurobiology of the disorder, although there's, there's lots of variability there. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of really interesting things today that make me wonder and, and think about ideas. Um, and then also, the, 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 uh, and, and we also, I should say, clinically with that population, we work with kids as young as three and four years of age, all the way up through people coming to our clinic for the first time as adults. Um, I can talk a little bit more about the clinical presentation. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, their clinical presentation it just emerges for the first time in adulthood. That would actually not qualify for a diagnosis, but it means that for whatever reason, uh, their, their, um, their symptoms are catching up with them later in life to the, fact, to the point that they're not able to function um, in their in their day-to-day -day activities. The other uh, population that I work with uh, primarily are people who are cigarette smokers. Um, and like, I think that the, we, we heard a fair bit throughout the day about the relevance of decision making for, um, from a clinical perspective for addictive disorders, including cigarette smoking. Like other addictions, it's pretty clear to see, I mean, smoking cigarettes, using other drugs, um, that those are bad decisions that are made persistently and repeatedly. And thinking about how those patterns of behavior sort of emerge over time is very interesting. And, and there's also, a, w again, thinking about cigarette smoking, there's, um, there's a bit of a vicious cycle that, that starts to um, play out in that we know that people who, are, um, who, who have sort of variation in some of the processes that we've heard about today in terms of valuation, risk, et cetera, those are the people who are, who are more prone to initiate cigarette smoking, but then once they start smoking, and, and this is true for cigarettes, it's true for cannabis, marijuana use is true for other drugs of abuse, those uh, repeated use of the substances then influences the decision making. And so there's a bit of a, uh, a, um, a vicious cycle that makes intervention and treatment uh, a little bit more difficult. On the ADHD side of things, there's, there, there's um, like, like I said at the beginning, there's less known, uh, we, we know a lot, but, but we st there's still a lot of variability in the phenotype, and so the relevance and the ways in which understanding decision making or faulty decision making play into um, that clinical disorder, uh, are, I, I think there's tremendous opportunity. Most of the theoretical and neurobiological work that has been done with ADHD um, suggests that pr probably the single biggest um, neurobiological, uh, you know, more basic construct that's been implicated in ADHD are, are deficits in motivation. So people with ADHD, um, even kids with ADHD, they, they don't learn in the same way as people who are not affected with the disorder. They don't respond, their behavior does not adapt to changing reward contingencies, for example, um, uh, compared to typically developing folks. And this has tremendous implications for, um, for the trajectories of these, the, these kids as they age into adolescence and adulthood with respect to how they interact with the educational system, what they get out of, um, what they get out of school, how they interact with their parents, what they're prone uh, to, what are, they're at increased risk for all sorts of other maladaptive behaviors, including addiction, including obesity, and other sorts of things. So again, th th this is just, um, this has been a, a really rich day for me as a clinician uh, and a clinical researcher to think about um, uh, ways to apply, and I think um, Scott Hutel mentioned it earlier, to think about how the neuroscience of decision making can really um, be guiding the kinds of questions maybe across the translational spectrum of, of how we're addressing some of these problems. So we, we also agreed a, a little bit early on that we didn't want to talk as much, but rather to generate some discussion at the end of the day. So I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over. Okay, if there's an immediate question, we can just uh, start discussion between the panelists and, and the audience. Any question from the audience? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the more euphemistic way to phrase that is that, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a heterogeneous phenotype, um, as is true for all psychiatric conditions. So modeling anything, you know, what, what you can model in a rodent is going to be a sliver of, of the kinds of problems that you're going to be facing with a, with a clinical condition. So, uh, but, but I think that the, the, that's, I think, one thing that is of tremendous value in terms of just thinking about, you know, what we're, 
what I've heard today, you know, this is this is a range of important endophenotypes that are that, that, that cut across psychiatric conditions and that could be useful in sort of guiding thinking about modeling this and other species. So as a as a neurobiologist, I think many neurobiologists um, primary interest in clinical research is what it provides us as far as knowledge about how you know the basic decision making process works. I sort of just want to flip that that arrow around a little bit and ask both of you as clinicians, do you see any information about the basic biology of decision making being used to therapeutically treat, you know, the decision making behavior in, for example, addicts or, or uh, people with dementia? Um, I think we're on, I think that is the frontier right now. I, I mean, I think that there are, there's just, and, and I, you know, I, I'm, I know a pretty narrow sliver of the addiction world in terms of cigarette smoking, but I know that there's a lot of emphasis that it, on um, interventions that are that have grown up from basic neurobiology in terms of all, you know, cognitive cognitive training, for lack of a better word, or, or focusing on um, uh, altering processes in ways that have been. Um, informed by more basic research. I know, for example, there have been a couple of papers in the smoking literature that are, that are um, using real-time fMRI uh, feedback to, um, to produce differential activation in relevant brain regions to try to reduce craving. Um, and they, you know, th these are, these are basically, it's, it's proof of concept stage, so it's not like we're rolling this out into phase two or phase three trials, but there, I think that there's a lot of promise there. So. Um, somewhat related to that, I think in neurodegenerative diseases, I'll just use Alzheimer's as one example. Um, one of the problems that we see early on with MCI um, are difficulties in making decisions, and it often plays out in difficulty making financial decisions, and so there are questions of financial capacity. And so what I found very exciting here today is that we could learn from neurobiology about the circuits that seem to be affected early on, and maybe develop better tasks um, um, better tools to identify who's vulnerable to this um, because the population that uh, is making um, financially unsound decisions are actually um, subject to be preyed upon by you know unscrupulous people. So if we have better tools, you know some of the things that we use in clinic are very very crude for trying to get at you know who's at risk for developing this problem. If we have better tools to be able to identify who's likely to show this problem a couple of years down the road. I think we could be ahead of the game in terms of um, trying to Yeah, actually I'd like to also piggyback on that. Is I, I think that um, there may be more value at least where we're at currently with our understanding of, of psychiatric disorders to being informed by decision science um, for, for assessment and screening. Um, you know, one of the things, for example, our, our director of our National Institute of Mental Health is you know, a, a huge part of their priority and, and his agenda is earlier and earlier identification. The basic notion that with disorders, um, especially schizophrenia, but also many other disorders, by the time they're meeting clinical diagnostic criteria and coming into my clinic, it's too late, and, and we've already we've already missed the opportunity for good intervention. So the push is on early assessment, and I can imagine, I can imagine sensitive assays with respect to how people make decisions about uh, gains and losses being administered to kids and figuring out, well, well it, it, I should, people have done this, but not in a sort of population screening kind of way. So people have characterized ADHD versus non-ADHD kids, and yes, they make decisions differently and they value rewards differently, but, but really thinking about how, to, how you know, could we use that from a screening perspective? Um, to identify kids who are going to be at risk for other kinds of problems. I think some of the, um, another example, some of the paradigms that Michael was talking about, um, that there's been a lot of work and a lot of rapid work being done in autism for early identification, because that's another disorder where we know, you know, um, time is of the essence and the clock is ticking. And the earlier, you know, by, by orders of you know, months, maybe even weeks, that you can start intervening with kids, the, the better the outcomes are. So I think using some of these kinds of things in assessment capacity is a pharmacy. Right, so I, I should add, uh, 
on behalf of Dr. Sun, uh, who's a clinician in the Raging Hospital in Jiao Tong University in Shanghai. He is uh, uh, he's having a, a unit on the functional neurosurgery, using uh, mostly using deep brain stimulation. I think uh, knowing the uh, uh, the so the basis for reward associated learning and addiction, uh, one can. Uh, use the, this type of invasive uh, uh, therapy on cases where it's really severe. So the, 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 the best example I, I, I know of is that Dr. Sun has the, uh, probably the largest population of uh, patients, girls with uh, anorexia, uh, the eating disorder, who, who, uh, girls who don't want to eat. And they are thinning, uh, they are almost, uh, they lost their, all their weight and there's all on the way to death, right? Uh, these type of girls, he has treated a, a number of them by deep brain stimulation used for Parkinson's disease uh, normally, but put that electrodes in the nuclear incumbents, right? the, the reward circuit, and it has remarkable effect. So I was hoping that he would talk about this, but since he, he hasn't arrived yet, so I just uh, mentioned that that type of uh, treatment, uh, based on understanding of learning, uh, reward associated learning, reward associated decision making, one might uh, eventually uh, help the clinical treatment, at least uh, in the really severe case. So, so this is just a comment and also response to Kinway's question. I mean, one other example would be Parkinson's disease for which uh, historically, we think about symptoms being motor dis associated to motor disorders, but starting about, what, 10, 12 years ago, there's a recognition that pathological gambling is co-occurring at a rate three or four times that of the normal population. And my understanding is that this has, this rose in part because researchers were now primed to look at this because of their knowledge of the reward system. And so we have a case where it's the, the effectively the recognition from other aspects of, of decision, or I guess neuroscience broadly, that sparked people think differently about that disorder, which now has led to changes in how you monitor patients and what is, uh, in some cases, uh, what drug companies do when they're uh, dealing with their drugs. So I think that that's, uh, just again, it's more of a comment than anything else, but if, if that's uh, consistent with your experience, Kathy, that would be at least one example where the neuroscience is shaping how we're at least thinking about treatments for one of these disorders. I think Parkinson's is a great example of what we've learned where we now recognize that um, just treating patients broadly with a, a medication may actually improve their motor behavior but may have cognitive consequences and may actually uh, bring out these behaviors. And, and you're, um, you're right that initially we had anecdotal reports of pathological gambling but then we began to learn from the neuroscience community that there may be something much more fundamental going on in terms of decision making. So that's a, a tremendous example of what we've learned from the crosstalk between the disciplines. So uh, more comments and questions? Uh, so let, let me uh, ask, uh, uh, you mentioned it already a little bit, uh, the potential of using decision making for early diagnosis of neurological or psychiatric disease. Uh, so I think uh, we might want to define decision making. Uh, from the audience, who, who the, the, type, uh, the main focus of today's work, uh, uh, symposium is on decision making. But uh, I am a bit confused about exactly what decision making is. Uh, the, uh, most of the paradigms being used is actually reward associated making decision. But the, we are making decisions all the time, to go or not to go, to walk or not to walk. That's decision as well. So are we uh, going to, in the field, have a more uh, defined uh, way? Uh, what, what do you think is decision making? Uh, what's the best definition? Are we, uh, if we have a good definition, uh, that the, if, if the decision making is considered a really broad context, then we, we are talking about a large number of uh, cognitive functions that could be uh, categorized into uh, 
detailed uh, tests uh, where would be, a, 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 in general, a good uh, screening for early uh, neurological or psychiatric diseases. Uh, so I, I mean, imagine uh, that in the near future, there will be a, a brain, brain health clinic or brain health uh, checkup, like our, our real normal uh, ch checkup. So you go there, not only take your blood test, you go through a series of simple cognitive tests. And, and everybody does that. So then uh, we will have a large population with data. And then we can follow their, track their development and we will eventually have good markers. I think decision making is a really broad category of type of cognitive behavior that might be uh, very rich in, in terms of developing cognitive tests. Uh, for this purpose. Uh, there's a comment, also a question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a, that's a great idea. What, what, I, what I was thinking about, and I don't, I don't know, maybe there the can be some discussion. I don't know if there is a, a taxonomy within neuroeconomics about, you know, sort of different clusters of processes. Um, but this, this, is, this is what, what the NIMH is, is already, um, tried to undertake a little bit, at least with respect to refining these, these psychiatric phenotypes, and they're, they're taking this research domain criteria approach, and I, I think there's, there's five broad categories of sort of um, endophenotypes that they're focusing on, P positive valence systems, negative valence systems, social systems, perceptual systems, and arousal systems, I think. So, and and I, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it throughout the day, but I think, you know, thinking back, you know, you can at least drop many of the tasks that are used throughout the research that I learned about today into, you know, probably into one or two of those, of, of the bins. And so at least from a psychiatric perspective, those, um, those clusters were defined on the basis of a lot of basic neuroscience research, genetic work, to try to, you know, parse out the variability across psychiatric conditions. So I'm not sure for, for neurodegenerative problems if that's, um, if that's similar or if there's a, you know, if there's a, a taxonomy within neuroeconomics that would mesh well to give maximum predictive ability. And I, w I would just say that um, I look at your question about decision making um, as a similar question when we say what is memory? So that you can break down memory in, into a taxonomy of different um, processes that are involved with different aspects of um, learning and retention. Um, I think from a clinical perspective, I think we would identify what are problem decisions um, or areas of concern in decision making and would try to target tasks towards those problem areas. So in frontotemporal dementia, for example, I, I'm not sure that there's one screening test that's going to fit all is my point. I think that um, for frontotemporal dementias, often you see problems with um, decision making that occur within a social context so that they're doing things that are inappropriate. Um, in, uh, in social settings. And the tools that we currently use in the clinic, to, uh, and I'm sure many of you in the audience are already familiar with this, that tests of executive control and things that we typically ascribe to the frontal lobe with patients who have frontotemporal dementia and problems with um, uh, orbital frontal cortex sometimes sail right through all the different tests that we could do, Wisconsin card sorting, Stroop tests, what, they're fine. But then they get out into everyday life where uh, decisions aren't constrained like they are in the clinic and they're a mess. So, you know, the introduction of the Iowa gambling test became, you know, very helpful in terms of trying to see who are the people that can't quite make um, sound decisions um, that might have applications out into the real world. So I think, you know, that's where I see a lot of promise with uh, neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience is the development of strategic tools that might help us in these very um, ill-informed areas right now in clinical practice that w we could really benefit from. Any more comments? So I um, can I can I ask the speakers to comment on uh, what they think uh, decision making should be uh, defined. So the one example I 
Kevin, you said uh, you were opening it up and saying, well, it's a, is a decision to stay or to go? Or uh, I would say that is a decision, actually. Is but the reward might not be on a trial by trial basis as we do in a in a laboratory. So they do one action, they get a reward. But to stay or go, if you're going to go across town to uh, your home, that's multiple decisions to get there, but the reward is at the end. Right? It just, for feasibility in the lab, we, we uh, make it usually in a trial by trial basis. Um, as far as, uh, I don't know if I want to get into what defining decision making explicitly. Uh, where I see some, some of these things going is, um, I know a lot in the clinical practice, some of the tasks they use are, 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 are very basic and they're getting more sophisticated. I think that beyond just doing decision making, we can look at some of these uh, emotional quotient things. We're talking about mm -hmm. autism and so forth. So the, the, a lot of the, the tasks that we use in neuroeconomics are game theoretic. So look at fairness and empathy and trust. And so if you're looking at uh, certain types of disorders, you could tailor certain tasks that are getting into things just that are not directly reward-based, but are you able to uh, tap into other more social decision-making? Um, so it'd be nice to add a battery of tasks for different types of disorders so we can expand those. And I think an advantage of using kind of economic tasks is that we have to know what the optimal strategy is in, a, in you know, an economic sense and what people actually do in a more de descriptive sense what they do. Here's a normal population. And they're very good for quantifying things. So we could find out where are some outliers that are falling off the continuum in certain aspects. So that didn't answer what is decision making, but that's, <laughs> that's my input. So can I say that in the new economics, the decision making is reward associate decision? Yeah, immediate reward associate decision. So I'm going to be the economist here, Muming, and answer as an economist. Uh, a decision for an economist is when there are a number of options or alternatives, usually referred to the choice set, and a subset of those options have to be selected. And now that's a very general behavioral definition of a decision. And the options can include doing nothing. Now, I mean, of course, the problem is that that's a very weak definition. But and it's very broad and it's very general. As an economist, that's really what we think of. We immediately ask, what's the choice set? If you say the set of options has one element, that's not a decision. If the answer is I can pick everything in the choice set at once, that's a, like an American supermarket kind of decision, um, then uh, that's also probably not a decision. And it's this act of sorting or choosing or reducing from a larger group of options to a set of preferred options economists think of as the, a decision. Anybody want to comment more? Um, so I agree with this general definition, uh, but I think usually implicitly at least, uh, when we talk about decision making, we mean a deliberate <coughs> selection. So I would exclude uh, simple reflex uh, as a type of decision. So you may go or not go, for example, you see a snake, uh, but you actually don't have time to really uh, deliberate about it. You just you know, act. In that case, in Rachel's great, uh, you, know, uh, you could say, oh, I could decide whether I go or I don't go. I jump or I don't jump. But you, know, you actually don't do that right? when, when you uh, just produce a reflexive response. So it, uh, I think I think it's usually we we uh, uh, when we say this we talk about decision making what we study is more deliberate process of uh, looking at evidence for or against uh, different options and evidence can include the sensory information it can include the estimate of values and risks and usually um, any interesting decision involves uncertainty. Um, so I guess, you know, now we can start to uh, define different classes of decisions, but uh, I think this, those are the common elements um, about uh, the kind of decisions we talk about, I think. So I, I'm going to do the counterpoint. So I think um, the, by drawing a line between deliberative and not deliberative decisions, you introduce kind of a Cartesian dualistic issue with neural processing. And 
we have so many priors in the perceptual system that are unconscious that it's, to me it's, and I think Paul also, it's kind of crazy to draw a line between deliberative and non-deliberative decisions. But there are, I think, time scale issues. So the jumping when you see a snake might be very fast and you might not have a lot of time to uh, modulate that decision through other processes. Um, whereas something that's slower, maybe you can, uh, it feels deliberative, but I feel like if we talk about deliberation then we, and we're doing animal research, then we have to kind of say that animals deliver. I mean, I just think it's a, it's a dangerous path to go on. That's my perspective. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, add uh, some speculations. I think in terms of the current uh, uh, approach, uh, someone at, at panel, our panel mentioned that if we use the approach, generally it's a reward, a machine-based uh, uh, definition of decision-making. I think um, human beings are not different from animals, not, are not different from monkeys. But in terms of, uh, I, I usually, I mean, I strongly believe that human beings are something unique, it's different from monkeys. But thinking the situation that some, in most cases, or some cases, we make decision not to get benefit, not to get reward for ourselves. In conscious, we make decision to sacrifice our own benefits, our, our own interests. I mean, in that sense, I think, uh, if we talk about decision making, in that sense, it's more like uh, reflect the, the function of, of uh, a free will. This is, this is a philosopher and a psychologist use the word. That's the free will to make a decision it's not simply reward associated uh, 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 like reaction responses. It's more kind of reflect uh, how this free will, this, this spiritual want to do, uh, how to do, what to do. In that sense, I think uh, uh, we can, using that concept, maybe a difference from the, the current uh, like reward-based uh, definition of uh, uh, decision-making. Um, I think there's an instructive parallel here. Uh, if you think about we're trying to find decision making based on external stimuli and how people react to them, that may actually be the wrong way to think about it. So if you think about memory, for example, if all you said is keeping information in mind over time or whatever, or keeping it along, online in time, then that would lead you to conflate two things that are probably distinct. Active maintenance of information over very short time periods, which people might call frontally mediated working memory, and long term storage of representations, et cetera, et cetera, that people think is mediated by a different brain system. And that, I think, distinction here, we might be saying they both are memory. There's at least enough reason to classify them as two different parts of a taxonomy to think of them representing different things. Um, turning this to back to decision, to decision making writ broad, I suspect what's going to happen is we're going to end up with brain data that allows us to constrain what we're talking about. That we're going to think differently about different types of controlled behavior because they are mediated by different brain systems, et cetera. So I, I, I almost wonder, just as to close the loop, the question is, is, is an unfair question because we don't know enough to know the answer yet. More comment? So as far as the deliberation goes, I'll agree with uh, Jeff on this. Uh, um, I like to use this uh, video uh, when I teach uh, about decision making um, of Kasparov when he's uh, the chess champion. He's playing 30 people at once. And he's walking down. They have a minute to think of their decision. And he comes, looks, bang, looks, bang, looks. He's making, it's almost reflexive. He's played so much that we all agree that chess is very complex decision making task. It's some kind of pop-out uh, uh, visual task for him. He sees patterns that we don't see, and he can make very almost reflexive decisions. Okay? Um, so deliberation, I'm sure there's some amount of deliberation, but it's something that's very uh, uh, reflexive in that. Uh, the second one is free will. Is, um, I don't know if that has, is, is important either. I, I use the example of nothing feels more free will than playing rock, paper, scissors. And you're trying to choose like, between those three options. My argument is that in some cases, uh, you feel this intuitively, uh, I pick rock in advance and I throw it, but sometimes something just comes out of my hand, I don't even know what's going to come out, and I'm conscious of it after the fact, for example. And I would argue that sometimes that noise in the motor system is making the decision for you. So there's, that feels like a very free will task, but at the same time, uh, 
the fact that you're conscious of it after the decision makes it feel like it's not very free will like. <laughs> uh, so I find it difficult to distinguish these as well. You can practice something, get very good at it, it becomes very quick reflexive. Um, does that mean it's not a decision anymore? No. Oh, we can continue over dinner. Um, so, you know, I, I, I perhaps uh, Nathaniel Dow also can make a comment on this. Um, I, I do think it's useful to, um, you know, define different kinds of decisions, and I would uh, still argue that it's useful to um, to say deliberate decisions are different from uh, reflex type of uh, responses. Uh, for example, at least operationally, you could say if in the first case and not in the second case, you can do speed up accuracy trade off. Would you agree with that? You know, you have, there is a process of accumulating evidence you know, over time, which may not be important for reflex. The fact of the matter is there's a speed accuracy trade off. Saying there's no difference between all kinds of decisions, how about model free versus model based? Okay, uh, continue over dinner, but let's, let's uh, end with a clinical note. So what would you like to see new economics develop as a clinicians? I, I think that I've, I've already stated, I think that if we had better tools, um, I think that would be a, a big step forward for us in clinical practice for our, our patients that are making poor decisions, if we had better tools that came from neuroeconomics. I, I, I would agree, and, and also just the, um, more opportunities for, for this, at least yeah, from yeah. my perspective as a clinician, is um, talking, you know, figuring out ways to improve the crosstalk. Okay, with that note, uh, we'll conclude today's uh, session about our lecture. Uh, is, uh, I would have the speaker in. Oh. So we are going to have to end. Okay, closing remarks.